folks. Um, so back to the topic of uh, global scale localization, and in particular, we'll talk a little bit about hardware now. Because all you've heard up to now, you can do on any computer pretty much. Obviously, the more powerful, the better. Um, what you cannot do on any computer is uh, any algorithm that makes use of special sensors, because you must have the sensors on you. Um, we have uh, some issues concerning ergonomics to discuss, so we'll only lightly touch upon human-computer interaction topics here. But obviously, um, if you're trying to track something and you expect a result, then the condition under which the tracking works is, is relevant. I've, uh, I've heard from, from Daniel Wagner that they did some testing for Euphoria and people tried to track their shoe. And <laughs> obviously it doesn't work if you point the camera at your shoe. Um, and we have to talk about computation. Even with uh, the great improvements in uh, computational capacity on mobile devices, uh, we are still very, very limited. Um, so let's start with the sensors. You all know there's a big variety of sensors out there, um, especially cameras. Digital cameras have become extremely ubiquitous. Who still recalls when uh, attaching the first webcam to your computer was a, you know, like a great thing to have? <laughs> yeah, okay. So any silicon graphics users in the crowd? You're all young guys. Um, so we had a webcam. One in, one in the whole land. Um, and other things like inertial measurement units, uh, GPS, uh, all kinds of radio uh, receivers, and then in addition more specialized kind of sensors like structured light sensors, laser range finders, ultrasonic sensors, potentially thermal. There was a nice uh, paper at last year's GISMA about thermal imaging, radar, and so on. Um, all of these we can use for, for tracking. Uh, however, we uh, primarily remain on uh, cameras these days uh, if we're trying to build powerful <coughs> algorithms. And the reason is that cameras give us lots of information. So you get uh, 2 <coughs> megapixels at 30 frames uh, per second easily now. You get uh, color, texture, uh, the images that uh, you're taking are theoretically you have uh, several million independent measurements, uh, namely the pixels of the camera, but of course in practice they're highly correlated, so they form uh, phenomena or they, they capture phenomena such as uh, light, shadows, edges, and so on, uh, which we can then use to reconstruct our environment and make sense of the world that we're sensing in that way. Uh, we can do that from multiple images, either by means of multiple cameras. Uh, that's uh, not such a miracle. I, I think if you all have a smartphone in your pocket, you all also have two cameras in your pocket, front camera and back facing camera. But we'll talk about other camera configurations in a second. And it's really cheap. Although, if you go too cheap, as we will see, then you run into restrictions again, which really hurts the kind of uh, uh, localization and tracking performance we can get. Uh, because it's not, it's not all good. I mean, the cameras are ubiquitous, that's the good part, uh, but they require careful work, and the kind of consumer cameras that you have embedded in mobile devices are not comparable to the industrial camera setups that any decent engineer would be using for professional applications. They just cut it a little short so you can make nice pictures, selfies. Probably it has a selfie function now built into the camera chip, but what it doesn't have is, for example, it's an uncalibrated camera. You, know, you don't get uh, things like lens distortion and so on from the factory, or if you do, it's somewhere embedded in the firmware and you can't change it. The cameras that uh, you have in your mobile devices are actually very capable devices in, in many senses, but half of the features are not unlocked from the, from the firmware, unfortunately. So we need to do our own calibration of focal lens, radial distortion, color metric uh, calibration, we have to live with the fact that the, these cameras will be very subjective to motion blur oftentimes, um, that they have a limited dynamic range and what's worse, uh, an, an, an automatically <coughs> controlled dynamic range. You can't switch off for most cameras up until recently uh, things like uh, auto exposure and white balancing, so you get random results and you cannot control what the camera does. 
uh, it may be that with the most recent versions of Android, uh, with the Android operating system, you get some more control about that. I'm not sure if people have heard about the Frankencam uh, interface that was an experimental interface with a hacked Linux uh, video driver a couple of years ago, and it showed what can be done in terms of computational photography in sort of uh, consciously manipulating images that are taken by, by camera sensors. Um, if you have uh, access to the low-level uh, hardware control elements of the camera. And maybe this is coming into, into real consumer devices now. But we'll have to see. And there's the issue of rolling shutter, which is often overlooked. Uh, intuitively, you would believe that the camera gives you an image. And obviously, that's two megapixels or whatever you have, um, taken at the same moment in time. But well, that's not true. Um, what most cameras will actually have is a so-called rolling shutter. Yeah? So you know how the shutters work uh, from the windows. If you bring them down, it takes one or two seconds until the thing is entirely closed. Uh, and the same happens with uh, the cameras. They will only image one line at a time. Uh, so you have a scanning behavior, just like a, a, well, a conventional cathode ray tube. Uh, display did in the past with the, with the electron beam, uh, you now have the inverse, you have the imaging process that goes line by line. Uh, and the reason is it's much cheaper. You, you can uh, get away with less hardware <coughs> if the rows are imaged sequentially. Unfortunately, that means that the world has to stand still while this exposure process goes on. And uh, in practice, that's not the case. And then rather than getting uh, this kind of image with the, um, uh, of the of the ventilator that is of course rotating uh, fast uh, here. This is what you would like to get, but that's what you only get with a global shutter. And if you have a rolling shutter, it gets all aliased. It all gets uh, temporarily aliased, and you get up, uh, uh, you get a sort of diced image with random frequencies showing up there. Um, now, even if the environment is relatively still, the, the user may not cooperate, be cooperative. Uh, and you ha if, you, if you do any real-world application, you have to think about the uh, dumbest possible user who's always doing everything wrong. Uh, and what users do, for example, is that they move the camera <coughs> while they're taking the picture. And it may be unintentionally. It's just a little wriggling. And you end up uh, with... Uh, with uh, this image distortions. This is the effect that you would get, uh, for example, from, uh, from a rotational deviation that is very easy to accidentally do if you, if you turn on the camera here. Uh, so you see how the relative um, uh, configuration of the tower, the lighthouse tower, uh, relative to the, to the camera axis changed during uh, the taking of the image and you end up with a, well, it's actually a skewing kind of effect. Um, the part where there's only rotation is actually the, the nicer one, uh, where you can, if you have, for example, from a gyroscope some additional information, you could try to figure it out. If you have translation as well, then it becomes steps dependent. These are parallax effects, and then it gets even much worse. Huh? Um, so uh, this is difficult to compensate for. Um, and. Uh, Obviously, there are um, global imaging sensors. It's only that for cost reasons, they are not built into conventional phones because the, co the cameras in the conventional phones are intended for taking nice snapshots and maybe doing a little videotaping of uh, people at the birthday party or something like that. And they are not engineered to be computer vision devices. And with a little extra um, effort, they could be turned into proper computer vision devices, but uh, right now, there's not the market for it. So you're all invited to create compelling augmented reality technology. So there's a good motivation for the vendors to put this into their into their systems. And you can buy really nice uh, uh, global shutter cameras with high frame rate uh, for a couple of dollars if you wanted to. Only they are not in your phone. Yeah? Um, by the way, a high frame rate is also a really desirable. Uh, component even if you go to lower um, uh, resolution 
CMOS chip technology would actually allow you to do that, but most cameras will not be built for anything more than, say, 30 hertz or so. If you can image shorter time distances, then obviously any form of incremental tracking that is tracking between frames becomes much easier because of the shorter face lines that you have. So that would be another change in hardware that if you talk to your favorite vendor, please require faster image update rates or programmable image update rates. Um, doesn't have to be just a single camera, that's again a, a, a matter of cost. Building a single camera into a device is uh, some cost element. If there's a, a business case like selfies, we also build a second, namely the front facing camera into the device. We could just as well build stereo cameras into the device. Here you see a commercial uh, computer vision stereo rig um, that is like a human with two eyes. and. Uh, you can uh, use it to uh, triangulate um, objects with, within, the single, within the same image. Yeah? Or, if you use multiple cameras, you might also use non-overlapping cameras, like in this Bumblebee uh, camera rig here, that is basically a 360 degree <coughs> camera, composed of multiple high resolution, I think six plus one on top. Um, uh, normal cameras uh, uh, with, with ordinary lenses and you get uh, uh, a very nice all-around all image that is for example very nice to compute uh, omnidirectional vision. Or the Amazon Fire Phone, a massive uh, marketing failure I should say, I think they stopped selling it now. You're lucky to have one device but it has very interesting, uh, um, I should stay close to the microphone, sorry about that. Um, which has a very interesting feature, namely it not, not, not only has uh, one normal camera here, but it also has four cameras at every corner and they're used for uh, head tracking relative to the device. So you get a kind of autostereoscopic effect uh, just from the fact that the system knows uh, where from, from where you're looking. And they, they thought it would be good for marketing and people would be buying all kinds of goods on Amazon if they can only see them in 3D. Apparently that didn't work out, but uh, it's a phone with five cameras and it was not massively more expensive than, than any other device. Um, for all of these options you have, obviously if you go for multiple cameras, the uh, technology to drive it becomes uh, slightly more involved. You need uh, synchronization, uh, you need to trigger the camera simultaneously. If you cannot do that, the advantage of having a stereoscopic camera over uh, a, a single camera that uh, computes images at, at successive moments in time is much uh, less uh, uh, a big win. Um, if you are processing multiple data sets from multiple cameras, not only do you need to have them in synchronization, but you also need the computational power to, to do something with all that data. Um, and uh, obviously, you want to uh, choose how everything is arranged, what the lenses are. So if you add, uh, if you keep adding requirements, then maybe you're moving away from the kind of mobile device. Even though the, the Amazon Fire Phone is an is an instance that shows that a nicely engineered multi-camera solution can be cheap, uh, but most of the time you won't get it. Uh, then there's also the issue of the baseline. This is a little bit uh, uh, a look into the ergonomics problem. If you have multiple cameras on the device, the question is where can you put them on the device so you get a reasonable result. If you want to have triangulation, in particular if you're talking outdoors, Clemens already told you that you might have to walk a baseline of several meters uh, to get triangulation of a point that is, let's say, 20, 30 meters away. Yeah? So if you're in a wide open space. Now, I cannot imagine holding a mobile device with a baseline of several meters. <laughs> uh, and with a narrow baseline, uh, you might get uh, high accuracy, but the triangulation is not uh, perfectly supported. And, uh, and so the problem is a little bit how much of a baseline can you have on a mobile device with this form factor, uh, even if you hold it uh, the old smartphone uh, in, in landscape mode will get maybe 10 centimeters or so. 
which is okay. I mean, that's the interocular distance, roughly speaking, that you have. Uh, the eyes are about six, seven centimeters apart. Uh, that's that's what you could also get on the phone. Um, so by analogy to, to our human uh, biology, it should work, but not for uh, certain, you know, for certain computer vision tasks. Um, a person would also not be able to accurately estimate the distance of a single point that is 20 meters away. Um, so the phone can't do it as well. Um, and uh, that, that may be one of the reasons why stereo cameras on mobile devices have not caught on so much. Huh? You could go tri trinocular or, or even more, um, so that would give you multiple baselines, uh, but then again, uh, does that additional hardware really help you enough for the kind of problem that you're trying to solve, in particular if you cannot have um, if you cannot have a very wide baseline. Or you could have uh, um, virgins, so maybe moving camera components, but anything that is moving is never a good idea on a mobile device. Um, that's uh, just way too complicated in terms of the hardware. So alternatively, we could look into depth sensors. Depth sensors used to be an exotic piece of hardware, maybe known for, from robotics and so on. Um, but uh, just by the price tag, it was not really something that everybody considered for their work. With the introduction of the Microsoft uh, Kinect and its siblings, uh, depth sensors have become very popular, but they primarily work indoors. There's uh, um, either uh, structured light or uh, time flight sensing, but they all use some form of active illumination, so usually it's an infrared laser source. Um, and you can build that in a very small uh, form factor. There's, for example, the Inter Real Sense, which is now available in, in some notebooks, uh, or the Google Project Tango, which you can't really buy unless you're in a special developer program, but it's kind of a forerunner. It may be, I hope it may be, kind of a forerunner of what future devices will bring. So basically, it's like a little Kinect built into your, into your phone or your tablet. Um, but with the structured light uh, capability, the problem that you have is that uh, it will only work if you can achieve a proper contrast uh, of the reflections. So that means it is primarily designed to work indoors where you have uh, relatively low levels of ambient illumination, in particular in the infrared uh, spectrum. Uh, and it's designed to work over short distances. As soon as you go outdoors, you will face larger distances and you will face uh, um, much uh, detrimental influence from the sunlight, which contains significant amounts of infrared uh, radiation, and therefore um, these sensors only work outdoors if you're trying very, very hard and you're waiting for a cloudy day or something like that. Uh, so people have reported success with outdoor usage of, uh, of Kinect type sensors, but I haven't managed to duplicate these results. Maybe it's because I'm stupid. Or, um, maybe, maybe in the future there might be some modifications, but that is beyond my knowledge what, what they have in store. I think it's very, um, it seems very difficult to build something that is energy efficient and could still work outdoors. Um, just to give you a little upshot here, uh, this is a paper that was uh, published by, by Clemens and Jonathan Ventura this year on multi-camera motion estimation. If you have multiple cameras, you might actually fuse all the information directly into your close estimation without ever converting that into some explicit uh, uh, stereo triangulation framework first. Uh, so there are now nice, ma nice mathematical models that could basically make use of any kind of of sensor, and I've already suggested we might try to do something like just the front and back facing camera simultaneously seeing things. And you, you know, the, the front facing camera sees a few features, the back facing camera sees a few features, and you might fuse that into common pose estimation of the rigid device that has these cameras. Uh, you can do these kind of things, but uh, um, since there are not too many devices that allow you to access. Uh, the cameras in that way, there hasn't been much practical application uh, for this so far. And you can of course ask yourself again the economics, if the front facing camera is mostly facing you, if you have a handheld device, you are not part of the 
rigid tracking model of the environment, of course. Um, so that doesn't make sense. Maybe that's the reason why this hasn't been further investigated. Um, okay, uh, the next uh, sensor type is the global positioning system. Uh, if you talk to, maybe that has happened to you too, if you talk to people who have zero knowledge of augmented reality, they always tell you like, oh, but why are you dealing with this uh, optical tracking? Does the GPS that it's already great? I have it on my phone, Google Maps, it always tells me where to go. Huh? I think Clemens pointed out uh, very uh, clearly already that the level of uh, registration accuracy you can expect from GPS alone is not going to work, although most people do not differentiate between the various flavors of, of, of GPS technology. They, they all work with the satellites in orbit, we know that. Huh? And it's a time of flight principle of a long distance. The question is, how many satellites can you see? Can you see only the American satellites or also the, the, the Russian ones? Uh, the future maybe the, the Galileo, the European ones. Uh, and how accurate is your signal research? Probably you don't want this on your mobile phone. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a, a picture of a base station that is used for the differential GPS. These are stationary, high quality GPS receivers that compare the signal that they get with the known, you know, pre-validated pre position where they are physically attached. It's a concrete socket, as you can see. Uh, and, uh, and they uh, figure out how much the atmospheric distortions in the area are uh, producing a wrong reading on the GPS signal. And then this is broadcast. It used to be broadcast uh, via special radio networks, but now it's just standard internet where you can receive what the deviation in your area is and by interpolating among multiple such, multiple such, such base stations you can get uh, a correction signal for your lower quality GPS receiver that lets you uh, determine position up to uh, approximately 10 centimeter or a couple of tens of centimeters accuracy. Much better than the tens of meters that the GPS will typically be off but uh, it is not uh, helping you in all cases. You need enough basic uh, signal from the satellites, enough uh, good uh, signals, uh, in order to get the uh, proper initialization for the entire scene. The, the differential correction doesn't help you if you already have a bad reading to begin with, um, because it will only uh, reduce the, the residual error. Um, it can work in real time now, um, but if you are in a situation like this, the typical urban canyon with high-rise buildings uh, where most of the sky is occupied, uh, then you will not get a very nice GPS result. Huh? Um, in addition to having a long startup time where the whole thing is, is initializing, um, and of course uh, mobile GPS devices don't have uh, differential GPS capability yet. That may have to do with the fact that they're not accurate enough to begin with, uh, or maybe it's just a cost factor because for most of the applications like car driving, uh, the higher GPS accuracy is not really necessary. Huh? Anyway, um, there's potential there to improve the accuracy. Uh, right now, very accurate GPS is still very expensive and the remaining problem, just like with the baseline of stereo cameras, is that you would need a larger antenna um, with a diameter of at least 10 centimeters or so to get the proper signal. So maybe some electrical engineers will figure out really nice antenna for the differential GPS. I'm not sure what's in store there. But right now, uh, the idea of course is that the GPS gives us a very robust prior for, for some post estimation. Um, uh, then there's other radio sources. You know, GPS is basically a radio technology. Now, if we if we do not care about the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, then uh, radio and GPS and uh, camera are all working with electromagnetic radiation. But of course, in practice, it's very different. Uh, this radio is meant to work over shorter distances and is parasitic or, or exploiting the already existing infrastructure in the environment. So in particular, Wi-Fi hotspots but there's also smaller things now that are intended for this kind of Internet of Things movement where you have very little Bluetooth beacons that you spread in the environment. Um, 
and uh, from that you can receive the radio signals and try to make uh, some position estimate. Of course, primarily the idea would be to work with triangulation, so you get uh, three distances to three sources at known positions and you triangulate from that. Um, that is a very nice idea, but doesn't work very nice. Mm -hmm. yeah? Um, because the, uh, the electromagnetic waves are deflected of walls and various uh, um, obstacles. They take multi-pass to the receiver, so it's the same problem as with the uh, GPS signal that you get all kinds of confounding uh, receptions. And uh, therefore the results you get are very mixed in practice. And if, if it doesn't work half of the time or doesn't work robustly, half of the time, then probably you don't want to use that. That's assuming that you're not in the position to set up your own infrastructure. There's vendors, uh, for example, for logistics purposes, who build a, a radio source, well, beacons that are strategically set up to give you a very nice reception in the centimeter level accuracy range inside some warehouse, for example. Uh, but that's what not what we're talking about here. We're talking about here uh, using the Wi-Fi that has been cartographed by crowdsourcing efforts. So if you have, I think uh, at least Apple has it now that uh, you can enhance the GPS, well the position service that Apple and maybe other vendors build into their mobile devices is GPS plus additional uh, readings from from uh, existing Wi-Fi infrastructure uh, and, and also cell tower infrastructure from the, from the G3 networks um, to get uh, to get the proper improved uh, location estimation. But you are, um, of course, you you're not in control over how good the results are going to be. So if somebody decides to switch off their access point or change the SSID or something like that, then uh, this particular uh, source of information vanishes, so it's uh, not a reliable source of information. Um, and uh, you can go to Bluetooth, uh, but then again, if Bluetooth is mostly on mobile, I mean, it would have to be dedicated uh, stationary Bluetooth infrastructure. Bluetooth is mostly because you can build a tiny beacon with a small battery that uh, emits a signal for a year or so until the battery has to be replaced. Uh, other than that, if you have Bluetooth in mobile devices, it doesn't help you much in the triangle issue. Um, and uh, you could go to software-defined radio that is uh, um, go to basically new kinds of protocols, but uh, that again would require control over the infrastructure as well. Um, what is that? So, so maybe uh, radio sources I don't see as a very important component, at least may, maybe for location-based services, but uh, but not for augmented reality. However, um, in contrast, inertial measurement units are already an essential component of most uh, augmented reality systems, of, of most mobile augmented reality uh, solutions. Uh, and with IMU, I mean any combination of uh, linear accelerometers, uh, gyroscopes that measure angular velocity, and magnetometers that basically measure the magnetic field. So you could say it's a compass, although it's a three degree of freedom compass in practice. And they're mostly built into very small units that you now have in your phones with a reasonable decency. Um, unfortunately, there's noise in the readings, there's the need for integration. Uh, that induces uh, significant magnetic errors, so you will always have to live with some amount of drifting behavior of, uh, of inertial sensors. Um, and uh, you have the gravity, which means you can measure the gravity, that's a nice aspect that you can measure the gravity out of the accelerometers, but it also means that the, if the gravity affects your readings and you're not precisely estimating the gravity aspect of the acceleration, the rest of the acceleration will not be uh, not be so so great. In, in zero gravity accelerometers would probably work great, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately we don't have that luxury. Um, you also have some latency in the readings and uh, uh, taking all together, uh, really mastering the use of an IMU is not so easy. Huh? You can go download the Android SDK, use the IMU 
interface and get some information out of that, but that is going to be the poor information that Clemens uh, showed you. Uh, and if you try to do better, you need to be much, much smarter about it. One thing would be, for example, be that you combine the IMU and the camera. Uh, so, for example, if the camera is moving fast, then you have blur and uh, you have the problem of uh, a rapid change of field of view, which makes all these tracking algorithms very hard. Uh, however, the gyroscope could step in and uh, compensate for that, but only if you've done uh, the job of calibrating everything to metric units and uh, among the components of the system very, very carefully. Um, in addition, there's no guarantee if you buy a consumer package that all the hardware that you need is actually there. Uh, most camera chips uh, have a shutter pin that allows them to be triggered externally, so it could be perfectly synchronized with the with an IMU or any other kind of sensor, but unless you pick your own components and assemble them yourself, this will probably not be wired and it will simply not do the thing that you want it to do and you have no control over it in a, in a commercial device. Um, if you can manage to do visual inertial fusion, I believe it's great. Uh, there's Harald in the audience who will confirm what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, it, it, this is not a new thing. Uh, there's uh, people who've worked in robotics on visual inertial fusion for, for a long time. Um, uh, the idea is not only that you have the sensors and then you have some control, uh, which goes into like an extended Kalman filter or particle filter or some uh, advanced filter to give you the state estimate, which is the pose. Now, if we do that uh, with, uh, with visual inertial sensor, with a visual inertial sensor for augmented reality, we only have a motion model at our, exposal, uh, at our disposal. That's not really a control term. This is only an assumption of uh, how the motion is probably working. Uh, and uh, the quality of the fusion result will depend on also the quality of the motion model. And if you make a very general motion model, uh, it will not be fit for all purposes. If you make some more um, constrained assumptions, then it will only work for a person complying with these assumptions, you know, like a sitting person, for example, or a walking person or something like that. That's easier if you have a robot. You know the robot is only going to go with a speed of one kilometer per hour and cannot take sharp turns and things like that. Uh, so this is why there may be a little bit of a gap between um, between what we know from robotics and what we know from mobile augmented reality or let's say variable computer vision or whatever you want because you have the person in the loop in this case the person is in this case and also in many other cases person is really a confounding factor a person can go anywhere do crazy things that a robot would never be allowed to do therefore the results that you get are not always as great okay um, so that was, the, that was the first part of the lecture uh, about uh, sensors. And please feel, to, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you, if you have a question. Um, if not, then I will uh, carry on with a little bit of consideration about ergonomics, and in particular the contrast between handheld and head-worn devices. Now, you would think that this is an issue for human-computer interaction experts who deal with user interface design. And that's absolutely correct. However, um, if we are building a real-time feedback system, we also have to consider how the human feeds back on the hardware. And the problem that you're having there is that, un un in contrast to conventional, let's say, touch interfaces on mobile devices, things also continue <coughs> happening in this real-time loop of augmented reality when the person is not consciously taking actions. Because if you have, let's say, a head tracker and you move your hand inadvertently because somebody is distracting you, you might move the camera away from the target and that's also an, an, a user activity or an input to the system if you want. Yeah? Um, therefore, this has to be co-designed. You have not only hardware software co-designed, but I would like to say you have hardware software user co-design. Ideally we would like to design our users or constrain our users, but we can't, so we have to at least uh, take it into account. Um, the, the, the canonical uh, augmented reality device of, uh, of today is probably the smartphone, and uh, there, 
uh, there are people here at the conference who will now jump up and say this shouldn't be like this. Uh, we would like to have a different kind of form factor. But that's just the most ubiquitous device that you get that is kind of augmented reality capable. And uh, it, it does have its, its uh, conveniences. It, you can put it, in, you can stow it away in your pocket. You can hold it in one hand, so at least you have one hand still free. Smartphones are universally acceptable. You probably um, will not, uh, you know, raise an eyebrow mm -hmm. if, uh, if somebody is using the smartphone today. Um, and you can uh, maintain a view of the real world unmediated while you have the smartphone kind of in your field of view. I mean, it's this dual view uh, setup where you have two representations of the, of the real world simultaneously, one time directly and one time on the smartphone, but it's kind of okay and it works. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you are willing to accept the limitations, so uh, obviously the switching between what you're seeing might, uh, might be even dangerous if you're outdoors. Don't get run over a car while running later. Um, they are not liable for, for these kind of accidents. Um, there's a mismatch of the, of the viewpoint uh, and the field of view. You get this perspective from the camera and unfortunately the camera is straight even though the phone may be held at some kind of tilted angle. Um, and uh, there, there may be glare on the surface, uh, so there's a number of, uh, of, of, of downsides. Um, some of them are, are uh, even more emphasized if you go to a handheld tablet. So. Personally, I was very surprised when the iPad came out and was immediately accepted as a new kind of mobile device. I was suspecting that people who had a smartphone would not be willing to carry a larger device. You know, a laptop is not really a, a, a mobile device, it's a portable device. You never use a laptop while standing. I mean, yes, there are some people who try to do it, but it's not really, you know, feasible. Tablets, uh, surprisingly, are being used by people even on the go. I mean, you see lots of tourists taking pictures with the, with the iPad. And if somebody is willing to accept this kind of form factor, then of course you can benefit from the larger display, uh, the reduced difference in the field of view, and just the more powerful hardware that you get on the mobile devices. There's a lot of difference between a 150 grams device and a 500 grams device in terms of computational performance that you can get out of it. Uh, but uh, other than that, the, <laughs> the disadvantages are uh, even more um, emphasized. Uh, this uh, it, it device now requires a two-handed operation, um, and that's not only for, for, for making phone calls, of course, it's good. Um, and it just gets in the way more. Yeah? Uh, and you don't even have one hand free for doing other things anymore. And, uh, Holding up your tablet, again, as I said, uh, the picture taking uh, with the tablet is now kind of socially acceptable, but it's still not a normal situation. Huh? And you can speculate uh, how large you can actually go. Would, would, that, would that person also do that with the new Mac, uh, the new iPad Pro with 12 inch? Huh? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I'll leave it open for your consideration. Uh, in any case, these are devices that are not intended to be to run continuously. You have to hold them in your hand. The fatigue alone will keep you from continuously using them for hours, uh, even if we had no technical issues like battery life. Uh, and there's the advocates of uh, of head-worn displays. Uh, so the you know the the, the canonical term is uh, head-mounted displays, but uh, we have all heard this, uh, this statement that these should be lightweight devices that are wearables or they're head-worn. Um, and there's, uh, there have been two very prominent uh, attempts uh, in the past couple of years. On the right-hand side, you know, the Google Glass. But the Google Glass is so minimalistic in terms of hardware that it didn't really offer so many opportunities for, well, you know, uh, significant augmented reality applications from the very narrow field of view of the display up to the very limited hardware. Um, Microsoft is now has now announced the, the uh, HoloLens, 
but of course we have all not been able to buy a HoloLens yet, uh, so it's very difficult to say how that will work out in practice. And I'm, um, I mean, there are some, <laughs> some people in the room who can tell us when we will finally be able to buy it, uh, if they were allowed to do so, um, but they're not. Um, <laughs> That's not the point. The point is also, I'm seriously questioning what I've seen from Google Glass and other commercial pieces of hardware, uh, if it will be low-level accessible to the point uh, that you can really uh, make use of the full capabilities of the devices, or if this is going to be like some of the software SDKs that, that I'm familiar with uh, that are on the market, where they're more intended for uh, you know, rookie developers uh, to make their life easy, and you cannot go and uh, and uh, reprogram everything. Um, and uh, apart from that, even though this is now hands-free, uh, if you look at the Hololens, its uh, its size and design today, I'm skeptical that uh, it would really be a fashion item that everybody. It's like a must-have. It's not like the Apple Watch, which is also ugly in my opinion, but uh, is uh, is a, a more more trendy in, in, in that way, maybe. Huh? So we'll see. Uh, obviously, it would be great if we had uh, really great uh, head one devices, um, and uh, there's. As, as you've seen with the Google Glass, uh, there's the issue that uh, it can either run standalone or in tandem with some kind of uh, device in your pocket, which may be more powerful, which may actually be a tablet or iPad or whatever. Um, and uh, maybe that is a really nice, uh, nice setup uh, that could work. Because if it's, if it's the eyewear alone that must do all the computation, I see a really serious uh, constraint in terms of how much weight uh, you can put into, into such a device. Um, and uh, then eyewear is, uh, is progressing, but eyewear is still not there where we would like to have it. Uh, the, the narrow field of view of see-through devices may be the most concerning problem still. Um, and uh, of course, eyewear doesn't have any uh, well any buttons or any any ways of operating them. Um, and then there's the whole problem with can you wear a camera that is looking at everybody taking their picture or are you socially unacceptable in that way. So all of this hasn't been resolved and it hasn't even to do with tracking. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's only, um, I'm only mentioning this to, to make it obvious that uh, if you had a tracking solution that really works and you cannot deploy it in the form factor that is necessary for the use case you have in mind, you also have no commercial case. Huh? may be interesting for a researcher, but uh, um, if, uh, if there's no commercial case, then it's not sustainable, because then we can build our lab prototypes and next year somebody will do something else. And, uh, maybe that other thing will then catch on. Um, yeah, so uh, how does it impact computer vision and, and thereby tracking? Well, obviously if you have video from a handheld source, it will be shaky. I've already shown you that this uh, is a problem with, uh, the, um, with the rolling shutter, but even with a global shutter, you'll end up with, with shaky video. Um, and uh, and this, if you have to correct for that immediately, it's very hard, because you cannot do like a post-processing where you smooth the entire trajectory. You have to immediately deliver the augmented reality information, and it has to match to what the camera currently sees. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, uh, you must make the user point towards the target. And it has become better, but the opening angle, uh, the field of view of mobile cameras is still not so great. It's maybe now at 50, 60 degrees uh, for, for most uh, commercial smartphones, which means you have to point very precisely, relatively precise at uh, a particular target. And if you get distracted or you make the wrong kind of motion, um, then uh, it doesn't work, it loses track, you have to reinitialize, the usability goes down uh, to the basement, basically. Uh, so that's uh, not really a situation that is, that is great. And the Google Tango uh, tablet has one unique feature that would be relatively easy to do. It has a second camera with a wide field of view. It's basically a fisheye camera 
that is intended for computer vision tasks. And that resolves a lot of things, surprisingly, that, uh, that cannot be done with commercial smartphones today. Um, and uh, of course this fisheye view camera is not good for taking selfies and, and uh, pictures of the environment, but it's, uh, it has a very good temporal coherence for rotational motions of the camera. Um, and I've seen surprising results uh, running on that kind of hardware because of that. Um, if, you, if you have the camera on the head, it may be less of a shaking problem, but now it's, it's basically, and you finally have something that can be always on. Huh? Um, so now you can conceptually uh, rethink your tracking. It can do things like, it can localize when there's the possibility. It continu continuously tries to localize. Uh, to perform tracking and then sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't which uh, can affect the user interface design in quite a significant way um, and uh, um, the, the, the issue still remains that now you have to point your head where the action is which may work nicer than with your hand in terms of the effort that the person has to put into it but uh, it's still um, can still not work if the field, if the line of sight of the of the camera is somehow different from where you pay your attention to. Okay, um, now let's jump to the last part, the computation. Um, that is uh, quite an interesting bit because I would argue that the increase in computational power has made many of the things that we are working on today really possible. It's the standard opening sentence of every ISMA paper that I review. Computation has improved and now we can do this or that. Uh, yeah, it's clear, but, the, but here the problem is um, there, there's never enough computation and there's never enough computation for your use case. Yeah? We now have uh, devices that can easily run the algorithms that we designed 10 years ago, but we want to run the algorithms that were designed last year on this year's smartphones, and that's still barely possible. Yeah? And in addition to uh, the raw computational power, which may actually be pretty good if you have, uh, I don't know, a quad-core 1.5 gigahertz ARM compatible processor, uh, you would have quite some, some number crunching uh, capability, but you oftentimes have uh, very limited bandwidth, and by that I mean uh, a memory bandwidth on the on the primary system on the actual computational unit. You have limited storage um, and limited memory bandwidth, and you have limited battery life. If you uh, put the processor to full steam, your battery life goes down to I don't know 40 minutes or so on your smart device. That's that may be acceptable for a research experiment. Even for a research experiment, can be difficult. Uh, but uh, certainly not for, for any practical use. You know? So uh, the, the theoretical capabilities that you have are difficult to harvest in practice. Um, and that's not you know, improving so much because you have this uh, problem that the battery technology is not improving so much. That is certainly one of the key limiting factors you get maybe 10% improved battery capacity every year, but not, not much more. It's not exponential growth on, on battery life and on battery performance. So um, the, the, the way out is apparently the cloud. That works for most of uh, computational problems, but the more you have real-time low latency requirements, and these are two requirements, you must deliver results in real-time and you must deliver results with low latency. It's not like video streaming. Uh, then you can only use the cloud if you do it in a clever way. Obviously, um, if you go to the cloud, uh, you need less computation on the device and you need less storage on the device. But you need more bandwidth. Now we can all say, hooray, that's great. We now have 4G networks, 5G networks, whatever. But they're very intermittent. The quality is very mixed. And uh, you have to design something where the throughput and the latency always works, which means you can probably today assume that you have some network connectivity, but not the network connectivity to stream full HD video <coughs> in both directions and uh, have a low enough latency to do the augmentation in the cloud and then just send it back. Uh, 
now, which people have proposed, but I don't think that is ever going to work. Uh, if it was successful, everybody would be using it, so we would be out of bandwidth in no time. Um, that's not, uh, doesn't seem like an economical consideration. Um, so we'll have to perform some computation, in particular the low latency computation on the device. For that you need enough computational power, you need enough fast storage. Typically there's a trade-off between computation and storage. Um, and, uh, and you will need less bandwidth uh, to compensate for that. And now we need to find some sweet spots in this design space uh, that work for us. In addition, we have to consider some technical constraints, uh, like uh, I already mentioned, uh, connectivity and latency. But there's the issue of privacy, of course. Uh, maybe this is no longer an issue. I would not feel comfortable with sending a video of whatever I see 24 hours a day from my Google Glass to some server, uh, have it processed there, and maybe intercepted by the NSA on the way. Um, but we'll see. Maybe, maybe, you know, I'm not an expert on, on privacy issues. <laughs> I will just skip over that. Um, there's also opportunities for uh, doing more computation on the device that uh, have probably not been fully leveraged yet because it's kind of hard to do it. Uh, one is, of course, using FPGAs uh, or some sort of dedicated hardware. There's certainly opportunities for uh, computing image processing tasks on dedicated hardware. Um, it's very interesting that the, the system on chips that are in the mobile devices do have uh, you know, either on chip or as part of this chip family. I'm not, not, not really, I, I don't really know all the details, but there are the image processors that do the camera image processing. Uh, so if you get some, let's say, contrast enhancing uh, settings on your camera phone, there is some image processing hardware that does it for you that is not accessible to the programmer normally, which is, a, which is really a shame, I believe. Uh, I was told by my friends at Qualcomm that uh, uh, OEMs do get to program the image processing chip, but researchers don't, so please go change. Um, the other thing are GPUs. Now, I've been fond of GPU programming for forever, basically. Um, and uh, I'm not talking about shader programming where you do nifty graphics. I'm talking about turning the GPU into a general purpose number crunching uh, facility for faster algorithms. Um, and that is theoretically possible today, but in practice, unfortunately, not really. Except if you go to the uh, NVIDIA Tegra chip family, where you can actually run the code directly on the mobile GPUs now. But these devices are not really widespread, apparently not so successful, and the battery goes on fire, uh, at least for the Shield <laughs> series. I'm not sure if anybody has heard that they had uh, some technical problems. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, having uh, a kind of system, it, it, it has shared memory anyhow. You have a single memory bank and then the GPU and the CPU and they're all feed into the same memory bank. If that could be done with low latency, high throughput, and you could run parts of your algorithms in some form of compute language on the, on the GPU, uh, that would probably be relatively, well, I mean, there's reasons why people do it on the desktop, right? It's because you have, uh, at the same time, powerful and versatile. Um, I hear that uh, for mobile device vendors, Using the GPU for general purpose computation is not so such a great idea energy-wise because it, uh, doing heavy parallel computation on the GPU is comparably more energy than doing it on some dedicated uh, vector thing like, like uh, neon instructions on ARM. Uh, unfortunately, it, few people do ARM optimizations, and uh, rather than using the GPU, they do it serially on the CPU. So that is certainly the worst in terms of energy efficiency. Um, if there was a better SDK support, uh, that, that might actually change. Um, yes, and, and now let me talk a little bit about some, um, some works that uh, Clemens has, has already briefly uh, mentioned. Um, and how they play in this uh, spectrum of doing more on the device or on the cloud. Um, so one idea is you just do uh, server-based localization. You have a reconstruction 
you do the localization on the server. This is the, the, the mobile device sends the image to the server, the server does the localization, sends the result back. That's a very nice idea. You can scale the server, you can engineer the server independently of everything else. The problem is the latency if you have to do that for every frame. So tracking frame by frame, tracking by detection through a server, it could stream, but then the latency would still be significant. Huh? But it's not a good solution, and I would question that if everybody does that, you know, for every frame, everybody, all the time, on the server, you have a very high computational load, even for a server. Um, maybe I'm mistaken there, but, uh, but at least the latency issue is a hard fact. Huh? Or you could do the localization entirely on the phone from some sort of reconstructed point cloud. Of course, uh, uh, people have done that. Uh, payments was one of them. Um, and that has the problem that you run out of computational power on the phone pretty soon. And in addition, you have the issue that you now need to store all the models. We're talking about gigabytes of point cloud data for larger models. We're talking outdoors, right? So. Uh, these are theoretically in, infinite in size, and uh, that doesn't scale very well there. Um, and uh, so it's not such a good solution either. Um, and Jonathan Ventura proposed a little later some kind of hybrid where you do cloud localization and then on-device tracking. And I, I actually like to call that um, PITAMAL. Um, so George, George invented uh, PTAM, parallel tracking and mapping, and uh, I thought this would be parallel tracking and mapping and localization because you happen to have three uh, simultaneous tasks which can all run at their own compute speeds. The localization which runs on the server is the only one which runs on the server and runs at the slowest speed and with the highest latency. Uh, but many of these effects are masked by the local mapping and tracking that continues at frame rate of the camera. Um, so, uh, um, Johnson engineered a system where uh, the, the tracking part was uh, relatively simple and then we said we could upgrade that. So a little later we worked on the system that, that Clemens has already shown you, which is uh, a, a PTAMAL <laughs> variant that does an actual six degree of freedom slam on the mobile device. Uh, and can therefore accommodate many more tracking cases and in addition has the ability of uh, stitching together a local map and then sending that to the server for localization. So if it doesn't work from the first frame, then it could work from the second frame or from the cumulative information in both the first and the second frame and so forth. Huh? So eventually you'll be able to uh, to get, uh, get, get the, the, the global post. Uh, also with increasing accuracy and, in, and as soon as you have a useful global post you can go to the global uh, point of interest database and display uh, the information on top of that. Um, that. That is already a very nice solution but you still have to initialize the SLAM system which is maybe the, the single uh, most constraining factor there. So what we're showing this year um, is uh, a system that does um, an initial localization uh, that would probably be on the cloud but with much less information. The information is only what you get out of OpenStreetMap basically. And it turns out together with the sensor priors like GPS and Compass that is enough information to allow you to do a, a, a one-shot uh, global localization. And now comes the, the, the really cool trick. If you have this rich, this uh, uh, rudimentary 3D model of the environment already um, and uh, you can initialize the global pose you can render you can initialize the slam map at the same time from the from the limited geometric information that you have available and you want to know how it works uh, then you must come to the, to the paper talk tomorrow um, and uh, so that brings me to my final uh, consideration um, after I, I said there are three tasks, uh, tracking, mapping, localization, um, and after some consideration I figured out there's actually four parallel tasks that must be considered in order to make a really useful outdoor system. Huh? So tracking and mapping, this is the classic thing that Georg invented basically. Um, 
then the initialization of the map has always been dealt with in various ways, has, has remained to be a difficult problem, but it's something that you need to get into the tracking and mapping, right? It's the, it's the uh, kickoff for the chicken and egg thing. Uh, and you have the localization, or detect, uh, I call it detection of the global post here. Um, and uh, what, that, what that gives us is uh, a scary diagram but actually a relatively simple idea. You start with an initial picture. You don't know where you are in the world. Yeah? You would like to find the global pose for this picture and you would like to find, to continue getting the global pose for every subsequent picture. So we want to go from uninitialized first keyframe to a global tracking state. Yeah? And now there's two problems that you have to resolve. You, have to you need some sort of slam system because the SLAM system allows you to do the local tracking, to do the incremental tracking. Yeah? So we want to go down here, and we also want to go to the right where we know the global pose. Yeah? And there's now two orders in which this can happen. You can go for the first keyframe to an initialized map, and then use the initialized map or some other byproduct of that information to go to the global tracking. Or you go from the first keyframe to first detect the global pose somehow, and then initialize the map from that, from the global post, because then you can query any server database that you have that is globally indexed. Yeah? Um, and now, if you take all these papers that we've briefly discussed together, you see that there's a number of paths how you can go. And maybe the most, uh, the most notable ones here that I would want to mention is um, either you go in this way here, where you do first uh, some map initialization and then uh, from the uh, a partially initialized SLAM map you go to the global tracking. So you query the, the, the global point cloud server with the partial SLAM map. And the other thing is this thing that we have been working on recently, where you first go to detect from the first frame the facade immediately and you use that to initialize the model um, so uh, you actually have the global pose before you have the SLAM map initialized. <coughs> yeah? And uh, there could even be loops here. If you don't succeed, you, you can run all these possibilities simultaneously. It would just be a very complex software system. But uh, it, 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 it's one that makes sense because you don't know what the user is going to do and where the user is going to be. And uh, the user could look at some facade that can be recognized first, or the user could do something else, or the GPS may be very accurate. Yeah? So you have uh, uh, various opportunities of initializing either the map, or the SLAM mapping, or the global pose. And you could even do that in loops. Yeah? Like you don't, you, you don't, you can go down here, but you cannot go over here immediately. You loop a little here, and then finally you go here. And because all these uh, activities are running concurrently, <coughs> you end up with, uh, with a system that is very, very robust and always um, trying to deliver the best possible result. And you might uh, fall back to a reduced operation where, for example, you lose either the tracking or the, uh, the global, sorry, the global uh, localization or the mapping, and it still remains partially operational. Okay. So, um, in order to let you go to your well-deserved lunch, uh, I'll conclude. Um, augmented reality tracking outdoors is also a design problem. You have to pick your components, you have many possibilities. If you combine them, you have more work, but the uh, uh, chances of succeeding and delivering the proper um, result are, are increased. Uh, and uh, therefore, this is... Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not both an art and a science, but it's definitely a craft and a science at the same time. You need uh, to consider uh, the sensors, you need to consider the ergonomics, and you also need to uh, consider the computational loads in order to make actual mobile outdoor tracking work. Thanks. Just, uh, I've just five slides to conclude the, the tutorial. It will not take long, I promise. Um, okay, this is the outro already. Uh, so this is.
repeats what I showed you before. So I think that uh, with this nice picture that Peter just showed a minute ago, I think this is a really, uh, really complex problem, and there are really a lot of possible avenues that you can go down. And uh, actually, the trend is 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 there, and we will we will continue also working on on more robust, more lo local, uh, more mobile uh, solutions, and also considering less environmental data, especially the structure for motion, reconstruction in the future. Uh, I just wanted to mention a few things that came into my mind while I was preparing the, the slides. Uh, in 2011, Steve Feiner actually uh, organized a workshop on uh, outdoor mixed and augmented reality, and I was, I was actually giving a talk there, and uh, identified challenges for outdoor AR, where basically limited connectivity, limited processing power, limited battery power, limited concepts for HCI, and uh, limiting computer vision algorithms, and uh, I think most of these most of these points were were discussed uh, already today. Limited connectivity, okay, this is probably gone since then, at least to some degree, and we can now send over small chunks of data almost instantly. Uh, the limited processing power is somehow gone, or it has at least uh, increased by a factor of twenty. But of course, there are these constraints that Peter has <coughs> has, has mentioned, so that. You are, have now more processing power, but a limited amount of time that you can enjoy it because of the limited battery that is not gone, right? So if you just try to compare uh, or, or look at uh, the developments technically that happened in the last four years, a lot of these a lot of these things that we had back then are still still valid uh, up to a certain degree, and of course the HCI <coughs> concepts that are limiting are still kind of. You know, you're still swiping and using gestures, but there are other controlling concepts missing that especially will be uh, will be needed for any kind of headboard display. So one last one last uh, slide, or actually two last slides that uh, that came out of a discussion that Dieter and we had on our flight here is: so why don't we have outdoor AR widespread yet? And of course, through the whole. Uh, morning, we have now heard about all the problems, and all the things that, that are going on in this area. And of course, we need to have a solution for many different problems at the same time. So that's why, that's one of the major reasons. And we, need, we would actually need real models of the world, like 2D or 3D, <coughs> to really come to an accuracy that is practically usable, especially in commercial setups. And we also would need uh, imagery that has been captured by large companies like Google or Microsoft that they don't uh, share with the, with the rest of the world, unfortunately. Uh, and we would need robust solutions to convince customers. And that's actually, that's actually one of the main important things, right? So if there is no business case, then there is no development into this area. And uh, we don't have actually a robust solution to convince customers, and we don't have a uh, we don't have them at least for a wide range of scenarios. We saw that AR can be very successfully applied if we just stick with local markers and some SDK like Euphoria and Metaio. But if we want to go outside uh, in, the, in, in urban outdoor environments, this will probably not work. And and that was actually that is just bringing up this point again that we that I just mentioned in the second part that we don't have the AR content. So even if we had the localization, we don't have the content to show. Right? And I'm not talking about just knowing that there is this or that restaurant, because this is probably a GPS coordinate that is stored somewhere. I would really need AR content, a concrete outline of where actually the door of this restaurant is, and where the floors, where, how many floors this restaurant have, and where actually the tables are located. We don't have this AR content yet. So actually, even if we had a solution, we don't have the AR content, and or at least we cannot create it at a scale that is really reasonable. And so, in this AR localization continuum, there are many open, many open questions still. But we are, uh, I think, we are all on a good way to really make good progress in this respect. And I think there are a lot of, a uh, lot of interesting challenges for future PhD topics, of course, and for future research. And that I, that's actually really the last slide. So thanks for listening to this tutorial. Uh, you might come back to us, of course, anytime uh, through email or just talk to us uh, during this eSmart conference. Uh, we will be here all week. Um, I will, I will uh, put up the video on some share that I have to decide where I will put it. And I will also make available all the, 
all the videos and all the, the talks, or basically the presentations. I just have to warn you, I didn't ask everybody for his copyright statement. Uh, so uh, just be careful if you want to further share, share this information with somebody else. Thank you.